A black sedan car slowly makes its way along Kurahashi Dori, a straight road in the Setagaya region of Tokyo, Japan. It runs along the edge of Soshigaya Park. In the distance, there are the sound of skateboarders, people playing tennis. We pass a convenience store before pulling up outside a ramshackle property, standing alone, sandwiched by wasteland. A lady steps out of the car, and there are a number of photographers and news crews waiting, cameras pointed, microphones in hand, pens at the ready. They follow as she steps forward, up the four or five steps, and to the front door. I want you to feel that they were doing their best living in this tight space. I want you to feel this crime scene. That's Anne Idier. It's the first time she's been in the house for years. That's because it was here that four members of her family were murdered. Her sister, her sister's husband and their two children. An eight-year-old girl and a six-year-old boy. Nina sat on this seat. I sat here with the children, talking to them, reading to them. I said to Nina, you'll be able to sit in a grown-up chair soon. Only the faint marks of the height chart are left on the wall. Through the media, I want the scene to be felt. I want it to lead to the case being solved. That's my number one hope. In the streets around here, and all over Tokyo, you'll find posters. They're on lampposts and notice boards, train station platforms. They show a man wearing a jacket, scarf and bucket hat. The posters ask, do you know this man? Have you seen him? But his face, well, he doesn't have one. It's just blank, like a paper white mannequin. 20 years ago, this faceless man broke into that house late one night. He murdered the entire family, then simply vanished. Ever since then, the faceless man has been one of the most sought after criminals in Japan. For the last 20 years, Tokyo police have been trying to find out who he is and where he has gone. Seeing the knife wounds, uh, it looks like they had been uh, that they had been tortured, like they had been tortured for fun. I just want to know why. I can't think of anything else. Why? Why the children? Why all four of them? This just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to the children. You know, the average Japanese person, when they go to bed at night, they triple check they've locked their doors and windows. And that's purely down to this case. This is a crime unlike any you'll have heard before, carried out in one of the safest countries in the world. A case which is hard to believe, because unlike almost any other killer I've read about, this one didn't try to hide his crime nor was he in a rush to flee from the scene. This killer did not run. He patched up his wounds, used their toilet, browsed the internet, and helped himself to ice cream. He drank their tea. He stayed the night. The actions he takes when he's in the house are not rational actions. And why would such a person hang around for so long? What's going on there? That, it's all very strange. Right, that part it makes... Uh, no sense. Absolutely no sense. The fact that the guy made no effort to hide his, to, 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 to disguise his, his movements. The guy stayed in the house afterwards. It was shocking. Detectives have the killer's clothes, his blood, his feces, his DNA, even the murder weapon. There are more clues here than in a year's worth of murder cases. And yet, more than 20 silent years have passed without a single suspect being named, a single clear motive being found, or anyone being arrested. Today, the house remains empty, 
alone in that park like a gravestone, guarded by an officer of the Tokyo police. This is a case which has to be solved, for the sake of the family, the police, for Japan. And it's a case which has touched far more people than I first realised. An entire online community of armchair sleuths and forensic experts who have poured over the details and helped me try to make sense of them. There's so much information about what he's wearing. I don't understand why Whatever you leave all of that there. That's got to be why I spin it. I can't make sense of why you read that. I Everything think I believe the hitman theory. My investigation has taken me two years. An odyssey that goes from Japan to Korea to Scotland and California in my hunt for a killer. I go on the trail of a hitman, immerse myself in Japanese subculture, and even risk trespassing on a military base in the desert in search of new clues. So, I'm not going to spend too much time here because I'm not sure if we're allowed to be here. And uh, I don't want to get arrested by the US Air Force. And as I inch closer to the faceless man, I'll start to question whether this is a crime that goes to the very top of international politics. And I'll learn how a controversial change to laws could finally reveal the person responsible. From USG Audio and What's the Story Sounds, this is an original podcast series. I'm Nick Obregón, and this is Faceless. Episode 1. Okay, before we get into this story, I want you to know something about me. I'm a crime fiction writer. My day job is making up stories about bad things happening to mostly good people. And I didn't go looking for this story, or to make a podcast. In fact, this case got under my skin the first time I visited Tokyo. I read about it, saw the headlines, and I went to the scene. A morbid fascination mixed with jet lag took me to read up on the case, and it became something I couldn't forget. I know, if you're listening to this, you've probably listened to other Unsolved Crime podcasts, and you might think you know what to expect. But this one is a little different. It's a case that has no simple explanation, not even a complicated explanation. There are endless clues, endless possibilities, and for every single one, there's a dead end. This isn't just another unsolved murder. It's a paradox. So I'm still going to break down everything we know about the crime and the faceless man and investigate it. But I'm also going to give you six theories about what happened. All of them credible and all of them incredible. And I'm curious to know what you think. While you're listening, you can take part in the discussion. Tweet your thoughts, email us, leave a comment. All the details will be at the end of the episode. But let's start with the basics of the case. I first heard about the case on the 31st of December. I got a phone call saying, we are doing an autopsy and could I be there? This is Takeshi Suchita, a 71-year-old former chief of police who was once in charge of this entire case. We're talking remotely, him in Tokyo, me at home in LA. In between the translating of question and answer, we stare at each other through a small screen, a mix of blank confusion and sincere, wrinkled smile etched into his face. He tells me, at the time of the murders back in December 2000, he was a senior forensics officer for the force, and his face changes as he recalls the sight which greeted him. Seeing the knife wounds, uh, it looks like they had been, uh, that they had been tortured, like they had been tortured for fun. When I think of the pain and, uh, and how they died slowly, they may not have felt all the pain because of shock. But when I think of their fear as well, it must have been truly unimaginable. It was horrible. 
And when I think of that, when I think back to that time, my heart aches for them. I didn't believe that it was someone from here. I thought it's unlikely that someone who's educated in Japan, who's culturally Japanese, could have done this. The chief's instincts are something we'll explore later. But at the time, the cops had to deal in facts. The scene had been discovered at around 10am on the morning of December 31st. The four victims were Mikio Miyazawa, his wife Yasuko, and his two children, Nina, who was eight, and Rei, who was six. When Yasuko's mother, Haruko, couldn't get a hold of them on the phone, she called around to make sure everything was okay. Haruko only lived next door. She knocked, and when there was no answer, she stepped inside and found unimaginable horror. For four people to be killed like this, all four are members of one family. Oh, there are very, very few cases like this in Japan. In fact, it was so unusual, the superintendent general visited the scene himself, the first time he'd ever done so. And he ordered the police to do whatever it took to find the person responsible. The mother, the father and the daughter had all been stabbed. But the youngest, the little boy, he'd been strangled. Detectives from Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department were tasked with gathering evidence from the scene and establishing what had happened. Their first thought was that the case would be solved quickly. There were so many fingerprints left at the scene. And so it would be very easy to check the records of anyone who's ever been arrested. And also, we could fingerprint all those people known to the victims. So I believed at the time that we would be very close to solving it. It, it wouldn't be long at all before we caught the killer. But as we know now, it wouldn't be so simple. Over the next 24 hours, New Year's Eve, news of the murders began to spread. And by New Year's Day, Tokyo, in fact, the whole of Japan, would wake up to news of a brutal crime. In the case of the family of four murdered in Setagaya, it has become apparent that a black, blood-stained glove was left in the scene of crime. This is the case of office worker Mikio Miyazawa, his wife Yusuko and their eight-year-old daughter Nina, and their six-year-old son, Rei. The family were found dead at their home in Kamisoshigaya Setagaya Ward on New Year's Eve. All the companies are closed, the government's shut down, there is no news around. So it would have dominated the news headlines on a regular day, but even more so because there's nothing else to report on at this time. Mm-hmm. I remember it was the, it was the uh, main topic over that, uh, over that New Year period. That's Julian Ryle. Back in 2000, he was based in Tokyo, working as a reporter for the Japan Times. Clearly something appalling had happened. Not all the details came out in, immediately. Um, it, it was drip-fed for a few days. It was shocking, the way the children were butchered. Um, you know, the fact that the guy stayed in the house afterwards, made no effort to hide his, to, 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 to disguise his, his movements. The fact that the wife's mother found the bodies, it's, it's, it was a shocking incident that has changed the way that people live. You, you won't find a Japanese person who doesn't know the story. That first radio bulletin had minimal information, apart from the mention of a black glove. The Tokyo police investigation discovered a knife used in the crime, which was found in the kitchen, along with one bloodstained black glove. This glove had a slash through the palm area and is soaked in a large amount of blood, a different type to that of the Miyazawa family. Police suspect the killer cut himself deeply on the palm while assaulting the family, and they're currently looking for his whereabouts.
we'll come back to that glove and its significance later. But, while information was gradually revealed to the public over the following days, weeks, months, even years, the police were quickly building a picture, thanks to a crime scene full of detail. They learned that the killer had apparently entered through a bathroom window at the rear of the house, sometime after 10pm. Mikiel, the father, had been using the family computer at that time to do some work, opening a password-protected document, his activity recorded by the machine, giving detectives a window for when the crime had begun. Detectives deduced that the young boy, Ray, was the first to be killed in his bedroom. There was no blood on him, and it was adjacent to the bathroom where the killer had seemingly entered. Then, the killer had moved to the centre of the cramped house, and there had been a struggle, which ended with the father, mother and daughter, all killed around the stairs. The killer had used a long, thin sushi knife to carry out the attack. During that struggle, he had suffered the hand injury through his glove. At one point, the knife had broken, and the killer had gone to the kitchen to grab another. But then, once the violence is over, things take an unexpected turn. The killer strips out of his clothes. He collects sanitary pads and uses them to dress his wound and stem the flow of blood. Then he helps himself to food, including several ice cream cups from the freezer. He gets dressed in clothes belonging to Mikio. He uses the toilet. He logs onto the computer and, for some reason, creates a new folder. He then seems to search the home, emptying a cabinet full of paperwork, filling the bath with water and depositing the papers inside. And then, hours later, he makes no attempt to clean the scene, to take his clothes away or dispose of any of the evidence. He simply leaves the house, perhaps by the same bathroom window or even by the front door, and then he just disappears. So, when Chief Suchita and his colleagues arrived at the house hours later, what they found was a treasure trove of evidence. There was just so much. Normally at the crime scene, you need to look carefully for tiny clues. You don't always know what you're looking for. But here, it was everywhere, in every room. The killer left his clothes behind. We heard fingerprints, we heard blood, we heard his back, a knife. In all my years as an officer, I've never seen a case with more evidence to collect. I worked investigating murders, arsons, violent assault. And uh, Tokyo police would conduct about five murder autopsies a year. So this was very rare. And it meant everyone was focused on the case. More than 20 years later, the case remains unsolved. But with all of that evidence, something doesn't make sense. How can all those clues not lead to a suspect? Why hasn't anyone been held to account? And what's stopping the police from solving this case? To find out, I wanted to start in the same way that the police did by looking for a motive. Was this an attack by someone who knew the family? Revenge or retribution? To know that, I needed to find out who the victims were. I'm Kathleen Goldhar, and I'm the host of a new podcast, Crime Story. Every week, we bring you a different crime, told by the storyteller who knows it best. You got one witness who can't be found. You got another witness who's murdered. We couldn't sugarcoat the story. I was getting calls from Cosby's attorney threatening to sue every day. Every crime in one way or another is a reflection of who we are as a people, as a city, as a country. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. He was a really funny boy. He made me laugh. He'd always say funny things to make me laugh. This is Setsuka, 
the mother of Mikio and grandmother of Ray and Nina. And he loved reading. When I'd give him pocket money, I could comfortably give him pocket money because I knew he would only use it to buy books. And because he was such a funny boy, whenever he'd leave the house in the morning on his way to school, he would find some funny way of saying, see you later, mom. Setsuko is 91 years old and talking to me via a translator over the internet. It's not the way I wanted to meet her at a distance. I was worried that our conversation, already stilted by a language barrier, would be cold and lacking in emotion. But after just a few minutes, Setsuko was fondly recalling her memories of her son. My son, he worked for an international company. They were a company that made logos and branding. One day, I don't know where they met, but he, he brought Yasuko to meet me and said, Ah, we are going to get married. Yasuko was lovely. It was brilliant. She was a great homemaker. Mikio and Yasuko moved into their home in Soshigaya Park in 1991. It's a suburban area to the west of Tokyo, a place away from the hustle and bustle of the city centre but with everything they needed still on their doorstep. In 1992, the couple welcomed a little girl, Nina. And two years later, they had a son, Ray. By all accounts, their family was complete. They seem so happy. You want for your children to grow up and be happy and settle and they had everything. It was just so normal. There was nothing to worry about. By the year 2000, Yasuko was a home tutor, privately educating children to help them get the grades they needed to excel at school. In fact, she was largely based in the home next door to her own, which, like I told you before, belonged to her mum, Haruko. It was a quieter home, and one where she could work without treading on the toes of her own family. But the proximity of the two houses had caused tension between the families. Mikio arranged for soundproofing to be installed in both properties, to give each family their own privacy. As the kids grew older, Mikio was working harder and harder. The company he worked for, Interbrand, were involved in corporate identity and branding strategies. His job was routine. He wasn't involved in anything hugely confidential or highly valuable. Workers there didn't believe there was anything in his job which could explain the murders. I found a quote from a colleague of Mikio's at the time. He said, He wasn't working on anything particularly sensitive or controversial. He was a congenial man who got on well with everyone. Definitely not the sort of person to make enemies. By all accounts, Mikio was well paid, but not excessively. He worked hard, putting in long hours. But that wasn't unusual either. Tokyo has some of the longest working hours in the world. Setsuko remembers that Mikio was always at work. I didn't get to meet Mikio all that much around that time anyway, because he would always come home late from work and I would have left by the time he got back. So it was really, it was the kids who always looked forward to seeing me, they would run out of their house to greet me. The last time Setsuko saw her son and the rest of her family was to celebrate Christmas. It was Christmas Eve. Ah, and we, we celebrated Christmas one day early because I was going away. So I celebrated Christmas with the children, and they even made me a cake. They made a Christmas cake for us. They hand-baked a cake. That was, that was the last time I saw them. Christmas Day is not a public holiday in Japan. Offices were open, and workers were expected to be present. So Mikio went back to work, and things continued as normal. Right through until December 30th, when the unthinkable happened. The police investigation hadn't uncovered any leads from his work. And there was nothing in the lives of the children, just eight and six years old, that would point towards any kind of crime either. 
the family finances were another topic for investigators. Were there money problems? Did they owe money? Were there clues in their spending habits to shine a light on a possible motive? Well, in fact, what they found was a family who kept tabs on every single transaction. He always kept a log of his spending from his second year of elementary school. Ah, up until that day before he died. And so because he always kept this log, I always knew that the family were okay. I knew their life was going to be okay. That log and their bank balances suggested nothing other than a middle-class family working their way through life with no immediate worries. But there was one pressing issue that the family were having to deal with. Their home next to Soshigaya Park was going to be torn down. City developers had plans and wanted the family to sell up. Over the previous few years, more and more of the Miyazawa's neighbours had agreed to sell, accepting the city's offer, moving out and seeing their home flattened. By that December, there were just six homes still standing out of the original 60, including the two belonging to the Miyazawa's and the neighbouring property owned by Haruko. It's not clear why the Miyazawa's hadn't sold up. I found online articles speculating that they were waiting for a better offer and that they needed to find somewhere close to a suitable school. Others suggested they had just put off the decision because of a lack of time and wanting to avoid the stress of moving. For her part, Setsuko doesn't recall exactly why they were one of the last families to remain. Mikio didn't talk much about it, but they had the perfect setup with the house next door. I just don't think they made a time to find somewhere suitable for them, for the children. All of this information about the family, their work, their finances, their house, the normality of all of it, well, it fed into the police's early investigation. There were no affairs, no secrets or skeletons in the Miyazawa closet that could explain why they had been killed. As Chief Suchita explained to me, the level of violence gave the appearance that the killer had personal hatred towards the Miyazawas. The way the crime was carried out, revenge looked like a likely motive. But we investigated both Mikio and Yasuko's circle, the people they had contact with. We also investigated the after-school class that Yasuko taught. We investigated all close contacts, but we hit a wall. And so then we considered the money. The city was buying back the land too, to expand the park. There were 60 households on that plot, but there were only six left at the time of the crime. We investigated this too, but we hit dead ends. We looked at the evidence left at the scene, the clothes and the weapon, and we hit a brick wall. We went as far as to go to all the hotels in the country and asked for uh, checking information. If you're a foreigner staying in a hotel in Japan, you need to provide ID and fill in a form. Everyone who stayed in the hotel needs to fill in the form stating their address and name. So we checked every hotel. The detectives worked their way through the chaos, upturned furniture, broken ornaments, things where they shouldn't be. And they tried to deduce how much of this had been caused during the struggle and how much had been carried out after the family were dead. We could tell that whoever had done this had spent time looking at documents and paperwork. Many drawers were open. Things had been moved. There was a lot to consider. Some of the chaos was perhaps because of the struggle. But after that, it was as if in the calm the killer had been more methodical. 
a cabinet with drawers had been placed or fallen on the body of Mikio. But the killer had then proceeded to remove the drawers from it and pull out documents. Some of them were found submerged in water in the bathtub, others in the toilet. Yasuko's personal belongings from her handbag and Mikio's wallet found their way there too. The paperwork, it was bills and documents, the sorts of things everyone would keep. But someone had looked through it, carried it to the bathroom, and attempted to destroy it. So, was the intruder, the killer, looking for something in particular? Was the rummaging and searching through documents a clue as to what the killer was doing there? And had he found what he wanted? Some money was stolen from the house, but there was more money left behind. If he was desperate enough to kill four people for money alone, you'd think he'd take all of it with him. So, if it wasn't money, what was the killer looking for? We never did establish if there was any document or anything of value which was taken. If there was, it's not something I'm aware of. Police stated it was a robbery homicide. Their theory, in the absence of anything else and with documents scattered all over the house, was that the killer was also a thief. The case was logged as a robbery homicide. To this day, that has not changed. That's still the theory the police are running with. But I'm not so sure. For starters, what were they stealing? Money? Deeds to a property? Some kind of confidential document? And why break in when the family are almost certainly going to be at home? I wanted a second opinion from an expert. Somebody who studies killers and criminals and understands their motivations. So I reached out to one of the world's best investigative psychologists, Professor David Cantor, and I asked him if this could just be a burglary that had turned horribly violent. The thing about burglars generally is that they are very careful to avoid going into property where there are people Um, because the biggest risk to a burglar is, of course, is getting caught or identified by the people in the property. So the willingness to go into a property where there are people is itself um, very unusual. And then to kill them all is, is very strange indeed. One of the first things they would do if they're an experienced burglar is check out whether there's somebody in the house. I mean, they would observe the house and they may even knock on the door initially to see if there's any sort of response. Um, And as you say, um, a family house at that time, the likelihood of there being people there is very high. Okay, so... An opportunist burglar who then turns into a violent killer. That doesn't really fit a mould that Professor Cantor has seen before. It's possible that they tried to make it look like a robbery. Exactly what was taken would be very interesting. There is um, some evidence from American serial killers. They do talk about killers taking souvenirs um, from a location, which fits in with the idea that the murder has some sort of psychological, almost fantasy qualities to it. In his experience, a targeted killing is more likely than an opportunist burglar. And he also told me that it couldn't be a crime of desperation either. Someone who would literally do anything to get their hands on money. It's well known also that an awful lot of of robberies and burglaries are uh, to feed a drug habit. A drug addict wouldn't hang around. Once they've got the money, they'd take off to go and get the drugs. That's the whole purpose of of doing that. There's always a possibility, of course, that the victims are accidental, that that they were not the intended victims. A mistaken identity, the wrong address. I mean, I guess it's possible. But in a street where all but six of the houses are demolished, it just doesn't feel likely. Like I said at the start of this episode, nothing here makes sense. The central issue is 
what on earth is the person doing in the house if he's not there to steal? And that's clearly the the debate that the police had. They will have said, well, he's, why else is he going to be there? Clearly, relationship to the victims has to be considered. And the vast majority of murders are carried out by somebody who has some sort of relationship with the victim. We know he's willing to kill children. We know he, he, he he's not doing this in a sort of wild frenzy and then running away. We know he's willing to hang around without feeling the sort of risk or remorse. We know he's willing to go into a house where there are already people who potentially could disturb him. I just find it very difficult to think of this as this person as some sort of jobbing burglar who happens to get caught out in one of his burglaries. Professor Cancer had one more reason to think that the killer wasn't just an amateur burglar, or jobbing burglar as he calls it, who got things wrong. Somebody who, you know, is a burglar and is, just took a knife to, because he thought he ought to just be, be able to threaten people and then the knife breaks, he would leave, he would run away. Somebody then goes to the kitchen to find a knife to carry on with the job. That's, that's, a, that's a nasty piece of work. I couldn't help but agree. In my mind, this isn't an opportunist thief. But I don't think it's a professional burglar either. Think about it. If there had been classified documents in the house or piles of money that might have been of interest to someone prepared to break in and take it, well, surely they wouldn't go into a house and leave thousands of clues lying around. A professional would go in, do the burglary clean, quick, and not leave four people dead. And that leaves just one more chilling possibility. There's ju just the possibility that he enjoys killing people. Somebody who commits a crime like this and gets so totally away with it, he's going to do it again. I'm not naive to think I can solve this case. A case which has stumped the entire Tokyo Police Department for two decades. They've deployed more than 282,000 officers to this investigation over the last 20 years. That's more people than the entire population of Reno, Nevada. But I do believe this case can be solved and that there is enough evidence out there to find the faceless man. So, in the next episode, I'm going to start taking the evidence and holding it up to the light, piece by piece. This podcast was written and hosted by me, Nick Obregón. My producers for What's the Story Sounds are Daryl Brown and Sophie Ellis. In Japan, my producer is Ryushi Lindsay. Sound design by Tom Bruins. Our music is composed by James Warburton and KPM Music. Our USG audio team includes Josh Block and Jennifer Sears. This is a USG audio podcast in collaboration with What's the Story Sounds. If you have any information or leads on this case, please email faceless at whatsthestorysounds.com or reach out to us on Twitter. And if you've enjoyed this series, please leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. And check out more USG Audio podcasts at usgaudio.com. <laughs>